Are you on microphone? You weren't last time. Retake. <clears throat> if I came to your house and sat on your nice furniture and you offered me water, what kind of water should I expect? And after you've given me the water, if you don't mind me asking, why? Why'd you give me this water, this, this purified, this spring, this bottle of alkaline? Or maybe you brought me a glass of water. Where'd you, where'd you get this from? <laughs> Did you, is this tap? Did you, are you tapping me up right now? <laughs> the goal here is to be super confident in the water that we drink. And in order to do that, we got to set the foundation. And you already know what I'm about to say. We got to add some perspective. <laughs> Welcome to No Lab Code Require, where I out-research your doctor to learn answers to your questions, whether you're confused or just curious. My name is Johnny, and I believe that the best decisions for our health come from a place of great context and insight. We're going to talk about water on a macro level, and then... We're gonna talk about water on a macro level in this video and then kind of funnel down and talk about more of the minor stuff like minerals and fluid balance and electrolytes in a later video. I'm a little excited to talk about water. Starting with the fact that we didn't always have all this fancy purification and filtration technology. So my natural bias goes to what were humans doing before then? In the time of around 500 BC, folks were just using the good old eye test. There were no purifiers or fancy reverse osmosis membrane systems to filter holes smaller than zero point blah, blah, blah. It's actually filled with granulated activated carbon. Folks were just finding water and eyeballing it. Over time, we started to advance and we got to a point where we were focusing completely on filtrating the water because stuff wasn't passing eyeball tests, but then we learned that we need to purify the water as well. Essentially, we start to make our own purified fresh water. But the curious point, if you take all of that advanced technology filtration, you just take it all away. And you look at the Earth's water cycle and you ask yourself, at what point is the human supposed to drink? Where is the most optimal water on Earth? The water cycle allows for there to be water everywhere. It's either falling, rising, or sitting. We never really knew how that worked until an old timer by the name of Peer did some work in 1674. Fast forward to today and the fact that Pierre was drinking the same water that you are today. I mean, the earth has had a fixed number of water particles from the jump. So it's like, uh, I could keep you up at night. You never know who drank your drink before you drunk it. Let's get clear on some important pieces of the water cycle. Evaporation, it's literally the sun picking up water. We are so used to this and it's happening before our eyes, yet it's so magnificent. This step is the start because evaporated water is probably the purest form of water on earth there is. This is the closest the earth can get to pure H2O on its own. I got a little something on my, my camera. Something we gotta understand about water. It rarely is ever just H2O. H2O is a solvent, meaning that anything that could be dissolved in water, when it comes in contact with it, it will. That's what we call osmosis. And a lot of things can be dissolved in water. We call those solutes. Okay. I was on my knees. And once evaporated water hits a certain height, the water particles condense and they get heavy and then it rains. The cloud water isn't as pure because uh, remember, water is a solvent. So any atmospheric chemicals or pollutants can get within those clouds. So we know that rainwater isn't quite it. Humans begin drinking water after it comes in contact with the ground because something remarkable happens next. Rainwater obviously fills our lakes, it fills our rivers, but most notably, it replenishes groundwater. When I first heard groundwater, I thought it was just water on the ground, but that's technically all bodies of water. Groundwater is water under the surface that pulls together in these crevices and these pores of the earth. Underground is saturated with water. You can think of a sponge. When a significant amount of this water is pulled together around rocks, we call those aquifers. Okay, aquifers are a big deal worldwide. And here in the US, they're used for about 40% of water supply. The reason these aquifers are such a big deal is because this is kind of like Earth's ripe water. You see, as rain is on its way down into aquifers, it's passing through oil, sand, and so on. It leaves behind unwanted particles you may find in a lake or river, while also undoing the effects of what you may find in toxic rainwater. And at the same time, also picking up some of Earth's minerals through the process of osmosis. So the surface of the earth is literally like a chef and it's just cooking and preparing this water and putting a lid over it and just waiting on us to tap into it. And we do, that's when wells come in. 
If groundwater is especially deep to the point to where it's pressurized by surrounding rocks, we call that an artesian well. Some artesian wells flow naturally out of the top due to the pressure. The water itself is about the same as any other groundwater though. It just sounds fancy on paper. If the aquifer groundwater overflows to the point to where it kind of spills out on the land surface, that is known as spring water. This can be a little trickle or it can be an entire pool and some springs are man-made by tapping into the side of an aquifer. The reason this is significant is because bottled water is considered a packaged good. So here in America, the FDA are in charge of regulating and they say that if you are going to bottle and sell water, you must state the source where it came from. And also, yes, sometimes we are being sold tap water but probably not in the way that we think. You know what I'm saying? Like, Daquan from 43rd ain't just bottling up his holes water and hydrating the hood. Bottled water plants get their water from public supply, just like the rest of us get our top water. But then they run it through another purification process. That can be reverse osmosis or distillation, for example. This is where purified water bottles come from. It's just super fascinating to me because every sip of water we take has a story behind it. And, you know, using the word groundwater might have us thinking low, but that isn't always the case. I feel like in modern society, we do not realize how much of a commodity it is to have fresh water. This is my friend Naomi. She lives in Spain. I don't live in Spain. Her and her family live in the middle of a mountain, so I had to ask her, what are you doing for water? It's not exactly easy to get fresh water. And she tells me that she's hiking up the mountain every three to four days with a wheelbarrow collecting gallons of water. Now, when we think mountain, it's hard to picture an underground aquifer, but they exist there all the same. Water hits the top of the mountain, seeps down, and collects some of those tasty mountain minerals while also filtering itself. And it doesn't necessarily have to seep to the bottom of the mountain. With all the edges and formations, there are plenty of opportunities for springs to sprout all over the mountain. And this is where you get all of the bougie water bottle companies claiming that they found the best version of water on earth at these mountains and no one's mountain water is as cool as their mountain water because they found the coolest mountain on earth. When a spring sprouts, it's kind of like earth's way of saying, here, have some water. Now, if the ground itself is this top chef and it always filters the water is groundwater always fresh? The short answer is no. Aquifer water, like any water, can be contaminated by the proximal doings of its environment, right? So if a farmer is just showering its plants in pesticides, that can seep into the aquifer water, as well as maybe the aquifer is under a gas tank. And what if that starts leaking? I, I, what if that starts leaking? Is bottled water always optimal? The short answer is no. We can talk about how plastic may be one of the worst places to store water because it can dissolve some of plastic's properties and now we're drinking that Kool-Aid plastic mix, you know what I'm saying? We can talk about how some of the water purification processes coming from some of these uh, bottled water companies can be harmful. We can talk paying for refurbished tap water, right? Like None of the systems are perfect. We can take this in any direction, but I wanted to make a note that it is a privilege and we are kind of lucky to even have these conversations in the first place because there's plenty of places in the world where folks are lacking decent water. Thankfully, we do have these options and we can have these conversations. And at the top, I said, this is gonna add perspective. Let's overview. Nine times out of 10, the water in your water bottle was either sourced from a lake, river, or an aquifer. That water was then treated at a bottled water plant and then sold to you. Spring water is water that comes from the overflow of an aquifer. Artesian water is water that comes from a relatively deeper aquifer that is typically pressurized. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a difference in the contents of the water, but it does help with its marketing. Purified water can come from the lake, river, aquifer, or municipal tap. As long as it was purified in the bottled water facility prior to selling, then it can be labeled as purified water. Distilled water can also technically be labeled as purified water, but it's probably usually labeled as distilled. It's the collection of evaporated water, which is or is about as close to H2O as we can get, remember? So it's basically naked water. It's mineralless. Mineral water is just another word for spring water, but it must have a certain amount of minerals. Alkaline water, we, we kind of have to spend a little bit more time here. Alkaline is the opposite of acidic, and acidity is the measure of a spectrum, and that is determined and measured by what we call pH. pH stands for potential hydrogen, and is determined by how much hydrogen is in something. And I know, hydrogen chemistry, like I, I'm not that guy. I try to avoid chemistry anytime that I can, but all we really have to know is that hydrogen is just the world's most simple little particle, and it's everywhere. Anyways, a lot of hydrogen think acidic, like lemon. Not a lot of hydrogen think alkaline. 
alkaline, like bleach. As long as the pH is above seven in the alkaline bottled water, it can be labeled as such, regardless of how it got there. And there are multiple ways for water to rise in pH. The problem with alkaline isn't necessarily its debated effects as much as it is its marketing. Alkaline enthusiasts tend to conflate acidic with toxic, and that's just plain incorrect. And well water is water pumped from a well. If this video made you drink water at any point, then you owe me a like. If you got through this whole video and didn't drink a single sip, you probably should. The water talk is not over, more to come. I'll make it about y'all way.